Salam. I am Reverend Charles Kwakode. I'm co-chair for the Faith Network for Manchester, but also chief officer for the Caribbean and African Health Network. And, and this evening, I'm very delighted to welcome you all to MacFest 2021. This evening is a special one, and we're thrilled to host an introduction to mural paintings. I am delighted to introduce to you, you know, this panel, Tiska, he, he, you know, and Atik, he, he will share a few words about Tiska. And I'm going to read a bit of bio about him, and then I will hand over to him. So he's a Muslim artist uh, that should be a mirror for our Islamic heritage. And that's a quote from Tiska. Tiska is a multi-award winning artist who offers a refreshing new take on Islamic art since the 21st century. His work has featured in publications and exhibitions across the USA, United Arab Emirates, Europe, and the Far East for over a decade now. He has exhibited his work to a diverse range of audience including various world leaders and, and Middle Eastern royalty. A true pioneer in his field, his groundbreaking work is a fusion of Islamic artistic tradition and modern Western te design techniques inspired by his British upbringing. Weaving together traditions from different artistic spheres and cultures, Tiska is known for his symphonies of vibrant colleagues and designs. He uses his art to bridge different communities by promoting peace, unity, and greater social tolerance. He has continuously evolving his work across multiple disciplines, from fine arts to urban art street murals. His distinctive style of art and designs are highly sought after by private collectors and design businesses. The BBC designs him as one of the rising stars in the Islamic art scene. The UK Prime Minister has recognized Tiske's effort as a mentor and a role model. He has received multiple awards, including the Alhambra Award for Excellence in Arts, which recognized the best of Muslim contribution to the British society. By blending the past with the present, he aims to renew the appreciation and the spirit of Islamic art and culture. Tiska's ultimate aim is to connect communities and cultures and challenge the negative image and narrow perceptions of Muslim through the scene, through his Syrian universal language of arts. At this point, pleasure is mine to introduce you to Tiska. Thank you for that introduction, Charles. Um, those are really kind words that you've said. Um, thank you, everybody, um, and welcome. Apologies, due to certain broadband restrictions, I found that my video profile has been dropping off. But, you know, alas, we're not here to see me. We're here to talk about my work. Um, so if you bear with me, I'll get this show on the road and share my powerpoints so um first of all i'd like to say thank you for attending this um, um little miniature workshop or talk um i know some of you probably could have done something better but this is an excellent festival and and, and i guess one of the main things i want to at the end of this kind of like small workshop just to kind of make people rethink about you know a islamic art and b about using it for in in the urban spaces um I th we're going to split the presentation as we, as advertised the first half was just go through some of my work talk about how i've been inspired and then you know um, then we'll basically talk about you know how i've moved on to you know creation using those inspiration to create murals. So as I start this, com as I start this presentation, um, these, like I said, these are what we're gonna cover, more, learn more about faith and Islamic art, discuss a variety of patterns and their uses. And hopefully, you know, we'll have a Q and A session at the end. I'll try to stop at least 
10 to 15 or 20 minutes at the end. So if you've got any other questions, um, send them to Charles and he'll gladly, we'll talk about those um, at the end of the presentation. Um, as as the um, as Charles mentioned, his quick kind of like information about about me, some of the things I've done. Um, I guess one of the most important things for me is basically rethinking what Islamic art, but staying true to its core. So, a question I like to say, I'll, I don't know if you, any of you guys want to answer this question. What does Islamic art mean to you? I mean, Charles. If someone says Islamic art to you, what does that mean? Sorry, Tiska. So, uh, okay, if someone says Islamic art to you, I mean, I can throw this question out to the public if they're quite speedy with the typing. What do you? What does Islamic art mean to you if you hear Islamic art? Well, I, I, I think for me, it's about art that communicates and and has you know, resonance with the Islamic faith. Okay, that's good. That's interesting. For me, I guess one of the um, important things to me about Islamic art, I guess if you take a step back and, and think about the current climate that we live in, um, there's an increase in Islamophobia and often the tolerance and beauty of Islamic culture is often obscured or misrepresented. And I think with the, like you say, with Islamic art, the core fundamental thing is basically art, which celebrates the divine or the almighty. And that's, for me, that is the core kind of like objective of Islamic art. If it's out that realm, then it's more for art, for art's sake. Um, uh, and I think one of the funniest things, well, it's not really funny, but if you look at the some of the Middle Eastern world or the Islamic world, art is actually faced, or even our precious traditions are faced with oblivion. Islamic art is probably more important than ever. The reason why I say that is because art has the power to engage and inspire our community by giving them a deeper connection to their identity. The richest heritage of Islam has always been associated with creativity. I find that often we are we're made to believe that beauty and luxury is only for the elite and wealthy. And you kind of see that in some of these expensive houses, you see loads of like gold this or expensive that. But it's not, it's in it within the Islamic world, art as um, well, beauty, Islam has never considered beauty to be a luxury. In Islam, art and beauty are not luxury. They're often necessity. Surrounding ourselves with beauty and art is integral. It's very important to our religion in the past. Anywhere that Muslims went, they built architecture and beautiful gardens. Muslims created places of beauty which reflected the divine presence. And if we, we can even take the step back there, um, the prophet, uh, peace, peace and blessing be upon him, although he's known for his incredible wids, wisdom, but he also had beautiful qualities that attracted people to him. His forgiveness, his gentleness, his gen generosity, all basically are some of the beautiful qualities that, that made him a great example and a role model for us. And then because of this, I think, art um, is really important in promoting our culture. Um, it, also often it often reflects the culture to basically other civilizations. Um, I'm, not, I'm not to kind of lead kind of lecture here, but you find that with this, especially Islamic art, it's more powerful than a group of speakers because even though they're masters of their own subjects, sometimes when you listen to a speaker, people can just find that boring or they look that they sound like they're being preached to. And often some people think that, you know, talk is cheap if someone's saying something so amazing. But if someone would take, create something visual stimulating and have the ability to open their hearts and basically get them back to the divine, 
that kind of shows you the power of art and how it's more important than someone talking about it. But alas, I think, you know, like I said, this is a visual thing. I don't want to basically be preaching here. So I'm just going to go through some of the kind of like using those cult, um, concepts which I've mentioned over the part and over this, that short little preaching sermon that I did. I basically talk about my creative journey. Now, I think to start this present, the visual start of this presentation, I think it's more, more, more mostly common sense to start with the word ikra for, um, um, well, as you know, um, ikra, which means read or recite, is basically one of the um, well, the first revelation of the ground was, was concerned with reading and writing, and therefore, thereby, it kind of emphasizing acquiring knowledge. Now, I kind of like to, because I think with calligraphy, it's normally like the peak of the Islamic arts, because it's because because sorry apologies let me start again um with calligraphy it's kind of like the highest kind of like pinnacle form of the islamic world and i'd like to kind of like with me i like to reuse stuff but connect it to connect it to its kind of like true elements um and i and i kind of like to visualize stuff which basically push things into the to its new direction, but also have a meaning behind them. For example, this next particular piece is the Arabic word for ilm, which means knowledge. Now, as we know, no, like I said before, knowledge is really important in Islam. Education and increasing your level, level, level of knowledge is very important. For example, in the past, in the house of wisdom, people were paid by people. People for every book of knowledge they would basically cr um, create, they would pay that book with more than gold. Um, and some people argue that Muslims kind of like paid the path to the the kind of Renaissance period, which the Europeans are really famous for. Uh, this fact, as you know, sometimes been ignored in the past, but recently they kind of like are now acknowledging the Muslim kind of like contribution to development. So these kind of like concepts of theories is kind of like mixing, you know, the calligraphy side with the historic side to give kind of like a an alternative or visual stimulant kind of image of our past. So basically, be, yeah, oh, I want people to basically be interested by giving them a nugget of information and actually carry on and do their own personal kind of like research or knowledge. Because um, I think that's one of the things that's good about what makes great art is basically, it's not only visually stimulating, it also stimulates the mind or the heart. Um, this particular piece I kind of designed because I found it kind of interesting in different worlds. Um, I mentioned this earlier in one of the earlier festivals in MacFest, is that how different people put priority on different versions of the art. What do I mean by that? Um, in, in the East, the pinnacle of art is the written word. And you kind of see that with Japan, China, Middle East, the calligraphy and the written word is kind of considered like the pinnacle of art. But in Western society, the pinnacle is figures and um, the human form. Um, you kind of see that with like the Greeks and the Romans, it's kind of like the human figure is considered the pinnacle, even with paintings. So then I'll, call, I'll go on to this, create something which kind of like, has an Islamic undertone, but also be kind of like, um, can both be used in both different societies. So this particular hijabi, I kind of like um, put her in a praying form and using the colors to basically show the battles or kind of like the beauty of kind of like prayer and trying to shine that through. 
but me, I try to, I know that some circles of Islamic thought where the face or more importantly the eyes are kind of like, um, are kind of hidden away. Plus for me personally, um, I like to create art which I'm also comfortable with. So it's actually, it's not the person which is important, but it's the symbol or the representation that the person give, which I think is quite important. And I think one of the most most powerful um, kind of like images is actually prayer worship. Um, and that's what I try to like do kind of like with kind of like these human figures more, create more of an abstract and actually show like a deeper meaning and the power of prayer. And that's what I want to focus on. It's not the subject in itself, but what prayer could actually help, or, you know, it's kind of like it's, you try and like make brighten your inside with colors. But one of the, the carrying on that concept, I, I like to kind of like cross different cultures or Abrahamic, I mean, different Abrahamic. I like to show similarities across the Abrahamic faiths. Now, this particular piece, absolution, the, the concept and the thought behind this is basically purifying your sins. Now, as you know, in the, the Christian or Catholic faith, you had Job the Baptist who used to baptize his kind of like followers to basically remove their sins. And, you know, you have various other faiths that use water as a purification, especially if you, you know, well versed in the Islamic faith. Um, when you, before you start your prayers, you're kind of like out of performing absolution or wudu or, you know, some kind of people. Um, and then some people, if you need, if you, you are asking for prayers or asking, you know, performing dua, you, one of the duas that you may, or prayers that you may want to perform is that it asks for your sins to be forgiven. So this element of using water and purifying, and that's the kind of like the message which I'm trying to um, sell with the image, but also trying to show how different cultures overlap each other and different faiths using water as a theme to basically show how they use, will use water as a form of uh, purification. Now back to basically the figures again, I tend to avoid faces cause I like to make art, which I personally like to put in my room. Last thing I need to do, last thing I wanna see is waking up a pair of eyes staring down at me in the middle of the night. So that personally freaks me out. So then I kind of like to hide the face, but, or, but also show the figure and what it's supposed to represent. Um, and this was my light trilogy, which I made. Um, and each of these, I'm not saying these are the most important aspects of the religion, but these are things which I think are quite important. Prayer, zikr and reading reading the scripture are kind of key kind of like um, core elements to the Islamic faith and, uh, and the kind of things that kind of like, I think light is also quite um kind of like a visual kind of still because you know our lives outside our lives was always filled with darkness so in these core kind of like elements um i like to believe that um can help us on our personal journeys um a funny thing is that sometimes some people say oh, you know, some of this art could be accepted in a negative way, but for me personally, I'm not, I don't think, I'm not focusing, like I say, I'm not focusing on the person, but more of a case of symbolism and what the image is supposed to represent. Now that, like, this particular piece, which is quite popular, um, I call Azan the call to prayer. Now, as you know, the Azan is one of the most, if you hear it done by someone with a beautiful voice, it's the most powerful thing. So part of me wanted to think is like, how could I reflect that in a visual form? Of course, that's probably impossible because sound and, you know, the visual kind of senses are different, but it kind of made me think of what could it be? So, you know, I found the Azan quite striking, quite powerful. So 
of course, using visive colours and um, kind of like loud, making it quite vibrant was one of the core things which I kind of follow, which I kind of used. Now, finally, this piece won me the Artist of the Year by the Emerald Network. So this play, this particular piece has a special place for me. But it's kind of like, you know, rethinking stuff or re like I said, the core thing is that I'm just trying to celebrate the divine. I'm not trying to like create false kind of like image of yourself. It's kind of like reinterpreting, but staying true to its core Islamic values. Um, this particular piece, the inspiration behind this one is, is um is basically the key parts of light and darkness. Um, I want to share the power, the you know the prophet's name, put my peace and blessings be upon him. Um, and uh, even in darkness, it kind of uh, his kind of like message or kind of like um, um, his um, beauty can shine or fill up darkness. And I wanted to mix in, well, you know, because one of the things I wanted to do is basically push the digital art kind of thing. So this was using digital manipulation. And I think that the digital element often gets a bad rep because they say it's it's not like the traditional method, uh, not using traditional kind of, you know, techniques. But for me, I kind of believe that both the digital and the traditional techniques both have the advantages and disadvantages, and it's using the advantages of both to create something unique. For example, um, a computer would never, ever be able to re replicate the natural stroke of a brush. Um, I've, I've tried it. it, it I'm a brain can see it's, it's the the fake calculation. It's t it's not natural, but then the advantage with a, with a, using the digital file, you can put, create effects, or use kind of like items which basically, which the masters of the past will never have access to. On the flip side of that, you know, there's nothing beats, you know, the the love of a traditional brush stroke and stuff. But you know you won't have that vast scale which the digital element. Now, issue like I said, I'd like to combine both to create unique pieces like these. Um, so it's it's using what you have and basically pushing them and create something a lot more positive, which you know a lot of people wouldn't consider thinking about or using those particular ideas. Um, from then on, I like to play. You know with kind of like colors and words. And these are the kind of like letters and these are kind of the core concept with basically I like to use and basically think, cause I think what I'm trying to show with this particular piece is the power of words. Uh, words can have great power and meaning and they can beautify different things. So I guess with the Islamic world, you have architecture covered in uh, with, beautiful calligraphy, you have items of clothing, which are called, and, and, and plates and, and so, and other little small items like that with the covered with calligraphy. Some, um, there's a, if you guys have traveled in, in different locations, I know that's a something which I miss kind of now under COVID in Malaysia. If you go to the Islamic museum over there they have the, these amazing bowls covered with some of the most most islamic calligraphy and these bowls were used almost like a medicine so when they used to fill it with water people used to drink the water and hoping that some of the blessings behind the you know the words would help them heal so i guess like i said before especially in you know the east words knowledge you know they're considered really powerful and the pinnacle of our um, like I said, um, sometimes I like to break down key concepts in Islamic art and reuse them. Um, as you know, it, the three main core aspects of Islamic art is geometry, calligraphy, and arabesque. And calligraphy, like I said, being the pinnacle, because you know the calligraphy is, is what the Quran um, is is used within the Quran. 
for me, I wanted to know what in geometry reusing kind of like particular shapes, because in geometry, there's certain shapes which are used as foundation. A lot of people say there's no, it's funny, when I talk to some people, they say there's no symbolism in art, but in Islamic art, but I, I find it is, but it's hidden in different elements. For example, the circle, um, often used as the starting point of most geometric patterns, has kind of like important meaning behind it. For example, this, the circle represents kind of like the symbol of wholeness, unity and perfection. It's the ultimate source. Um, it's just kind of showing, you know, because it's everlasting, it shows one of those, um, how, 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 how do I put it? It's like, uh, no, there's a word I'm trying to think of, and then it's kind of coming to me. It's, um, you know, the circle represents an attribute of God. We're not trying to say to him that God is the circle. No, it's because it's everlasting, that is an attribute of God. Um, because it's all, because it has no beginning and no end. For in the same way, they triangle another a well-known core geometric shape is the symbol of um, of consciousness. Basically, in a way, it's kind of showing all of God's knowledge, what has happened, what's going to happen, and what's currently known. And these kind of like symbol, like I said, we're not trying to show kind of corrupt the core values of Islamic art, but we're basically saying, you know, the, the triangle has an is symbolizing God's kind of like knowledge. And then I like to you kind of focus on those kind of small kind of ideas and concepts and exploring them and basically creating something new. Um, so therefore, I spent, you know, a lot of these time um, studying about these concepts. And then I, I, I wanted to evolve, include them in my mural work. Um, what I say, as you can hear, see, this is probably one of, if the ones who don't know, a mural is basically um, and a piece of artwork attached to a wall. And I think that's quite important, especially now. Um, there's this particular quote that I, I like about Jose. Now, the one of the reasons why I like this quote is kind of it emphasizes the fact that murals belong to the people. Now, as I said in my first introduction, Islamic art is not a, it's not for the elite, it's not for luxury, it's a necessity. And I think mural work is basically, especially street art, is recognized as as a art by the people because it's not hidden away in a private location or private vault by some elite person is open to the public. And I think that's one of the core importance of murals and street art. Um, this particular piece was created in East London. I think, especially now, street art is a recognized art form. And it's also been credited to basically tackling antisocial behavior and pro of providing low cost tool for all urban regeneration street art, especially murals, can basically change the perception of a space by painting. And one of the most important things is basically encouraging these community air art based kind of like mural work, because one of the important things is it can, can give opportunities for people who are artists to be involved in street art. People care about public places when they have mostly connected to them. And then giving them the able to, to compute, con contribute to a mural, um, communities of art like this can basically is an effective tool to inject life into abandoned spaces. Um, like I said, murals can be often used as a low cost tool for urban regeneration. Um, a community art form that's based on the creation of mural artworks in the city through community involvement can counter social 
you know, negative kind of like urban degradation. And I think that's one of the core, you know, important factors that I like to see in Movie Rock. A, it's, there's a great community element to it. And B, you know, every, every, it, it's something which can be enjoyed by the public. So then I kind of thought, right, how can we, using the mural, how can I reinterpret it? Um, Islamic art for kind of like modern kind of thoughts. Now, there's a there's a thing when I was researching. Um, I just want to annotate this. There's um, a thing called pseudo calligraphy, which was quite popular in the in the Christian kind of art movement. Now, if you focused on these elements here. As you can see, and over here, we, um, if I ignore those, you, what would happen in the past is that a lot of Christians used to basically sorry, I'm just trying to hide the annotations. So a lot of Christians used to go to the Middle East and see Islamic calligraphy. And it was used to be plastered everywhere, but at the time they couldn't understand it. So then they it connected Islamic calligraphy with um, holy buildings and religious kind of like aspects. And so unfortunately the Christians of the past they couldn't understand calligraphy. So then they took this kind of like what they thought was calligraphy in, in and they include it in their kind of like paintings and, and involve and it included them to show symbolize holy kind of like people, for example, Mariam and, you know, the clothes and stuff to, sh to emphasize the holy factor. Of course, they got the entire structure of the Arabic calligraphy completely wrong, but they're trying to like show, uh, they try to use this so-called um, pseudo Arabic or calligraphy to emphasize holiness. So, Another thing which in my research, I come across, for those who do know, William Morris. And he was a famous British textile designer, some consider the genius. Um, and he was a major contributor to the revival of traditional British textile arts methods of production. However, a lot of people could argue that much of his kind of like designs um, were incredibly influenced by Islamic carpets and you know Persian kind of like influence patterns and so on from the Islamic world um, and you know sometimes I think it's kind of sad that you know as Muslim creatives especially of the masters of the past they're not credited for the influence they have um, made on the west because as you can see from the pseudo calligraphy and especially this pattern work here, they, they greatly introduce some amazing designs. So one thing I wanted to play around is in some of my mural is using these concepts and reinterpreting them in a kind of new idea. So one of the things I wanted to do was create this particular mural, which I wanted to use the pseudo, pseudo calligraphy of the past, but actually use the correct form. But then also, you know, influence kind of like the Western ideas of using those Arabic patterns, which were influenced by William Morris. Um, so this was a mural that I kind of did in Buckinghamshire. Um, and using those basically concept, which I touched upon. Um, the, the funny thing is, because a lot of people say, you know, that's just letters, they don't have any real meaning. But if you actually research um, the Arabic letters itself, each of them have, have kind of like amazing kind of um, attributes or, or shows the attributes of God. For example, for example, um, the letter Ba, or especially the Nukta, they kind of like, um, 
you, you some some people argue that the entire kind of like the, the, with the letter bar, you, the entire knowledge is contained with that in that letter. Um, the Aleph because shows because of its straightness and height is a like shows the power of basically God. So of apologies for that really poor um, explanation. I haven't really done it enough justice, but I'm kind of concerned on time at the moment. Um, but it's, it's kind of getting those core, core concepts and basically reinterpreting them um, using modern day design. So this particular mural, I'm trying to show how different kind of like Islamic patterns work together, but also unfortunately, the I'm also showing the destruction of Islamic art. And I think it's a shame that a lot of our, you know, historic architecture has been lost throughout time, either due to, you know, modernization or, they, I don't know why sometimes I find that the Islamic world feels like their work isn't good enough or their history is not good enough and they have to be, they always feel like, oh, we need to get like Western designs to like, basically, it shows like we're kind of modern and it's like it's almost like suffering from an inferior, kind of like some sort of inferior complex that our car art is good enough, but it's also showing that what can, what is the possibility of, you know, modern Islamic art that we can use. One of the things I'd also like to show is how different, like I said, different cultures can be also interpreted. So using mixing Arabic calligraphy with Japanese design, because, you know, shapes and how, because one, like I said, I want to show how different cultures can work harmlessly together and using those basically core values to create unique pieces of work and this kind of idea of using like custom made wallpaper. Um, and um, like, oh, I just want to like re think what could be used Islamic art for. Like I said, it's creating new concepts and ideas uh, making custom made wallpapers but keeping streaking strong to basically tradition, I kind of think, you know, you can have innovation, but then you also want to stay true to the past because if we still, because the problem is if we focus too much on the past, we won't move forward. But we also know um, that at the same time, you have to respect the masters of the past and what they do to it and use that as a foundation. So, like I said, one thing I also find is quite. I want to. I want to pop. One of the most important things about mural is basically revitalizing communities. Because if you have something which, was like I mentioned before, you have a connection with them. Um, there's a lot of like places in the UK and across the world where there's areas which are basically ignored or basically. Um, not uh, kept looked after, but the moment where there's a mural or or of something which is important to that person's culture, then people make an effort to basically clean that area and make keep that place attractive just by a simple case of artwork. Um, now this is a strong piece. Like I said, I'm just trying to like re kind of like tell the story of a lost heritage. Um, and I think what is, what is really important to us is that we need to fill our houses with beauty because if we ignore our heritage or basically not have our homes filled with Islamic art, we're going to have this heritage which is lost to us. And unfortunately, I, have, I hate to say that there was some amazing Ottoman architecture in Mecca, which is now unfortunately lost to the aspects of time. Um, due to modernization and it there's the problem is there's there's you have to be quite like one thing I've kind of realized is that I may talk about modernization but there's also an element of respect there um because there's some like for example there's there's now in Turkey there's uh, there's these tulips recovered in a particular red and to this day they can't figure out how they created that 
color of red using the materials of the past and that knowledge is lost and and unfortunately the more we ignore this kind of like heritage is ours the more things we lost in our our timeline and and, and, and the thing is we need to be filling a house with basically beauty Islamic art because it's a constant visual zikr and then you're constantly reminded by the divine and I think that's the most important thing of or one of the most important things of that Islam, Islamic art is that constant visual zikr that you get that reminder and pleasant and the, the and, you know emphasizing you know beauty and you know I don't have to say that famous hadith about beauty and and the um and how Allah loves beauty but you know we should be encouraged to kind of like have like these beautiful things in our homes and in the walls around us. Um, because one of the thing was thing is going into a city in this cold gray walls and it's actually quite off putting, but, you know, adding kind of like vibrancy of color, making things more amazing. And I think colors have that ability to do that can liven up places even kind of like simple things like sh like in here shutters but that moving on this is like board um i kind of find a like some especially when you have new construction site you normally have these horrible boardings so sometimes if you get the right permit per uh, permission actually you know add basically some beautiful geometric art to basically liven those horrible gray board uh, you know Workmen bore borders around these kind of construction sites to make you a bit, a bit more visual stimulating. I think that's the key thing with the Islamic art, using it as a you know beautifying tool to kind of like you know cold locations. Um, I, some of these designs are not classically Islamic patterns and designs, but I guess one thing I'm trying to do is add a contemporary edge with them trying to like you know push things not push things to a it's no longer islamic art because some people say you know because one thing i believe is that there's there's two types of muslim artists if your aim for your art is to celebrate the art it's then you should be known as a muslim artist but one thing i kind of find is that Many artists, what the thing, what they normally display, is their ego. For example, an artist will always put their ego on display. It's like, look how clever I am, look how amazing I am. I'm, I, me, me. It's that person's ego on display. Now, Islamic art, I think this is really important. Is that it's nothing to do about the individual. It's something greater than that. It's about the spiritual divine, and it's celebrating that factor. And I think that's why I would argue that you know Islamic art could be greater than Western art. It's not about you. It's about the message that you're trying to give out. And I think that's the one of the most important factor. And I guess this is why. Like I said, I think it's better than most Western artists because it's, it's not, you're not selling your ego, you're selling a, a message greater than that. Um, this is another mural which I kind of like playing around with concepts and ideas on a rooftop that I did in Shoreditch. Just kind of like, you know, re-emphasizing that message of basically beautifying locations. Now, I know that we're kind of running short of time, so I'll, I'll basically finish off quite soon here so um well, there's one thing i our previous project of mine was basically art in advert spaces now um the aim of these projects is basically i find adverts quite negative and there's many kind of movements like add in advert spaces and ad block which um, use this kind of movement to basically have artwork and advert, pla advert places because sometimes um, adverts have basically a negative kind of like um, psychological factor. Now, one thing I want people to walk, want people to do is walk down the street, some, the street and see something nice, something beautiful. That's not trying to sell you anything because you know. It's actually quite disturbing when you see an advert and it, you know, it's making you feel kind of 
insecure about yourself or makes you think you're not good enough or you need to buy this certain thing to make you part of a collective and so I wanted to fight that kind of like kind of messages and basically put our art in you know those kind of like locations where you know you you're looking at something which you know is pleasant and it's not making you feel kind of giving you a kind of making you feel negative about yourself um and you know it's art for art's sake now I just want to finish off by saying, and I know I probably overstepped my time, um, but I just want to finish with this final thought. It's like Islam has a has a Islam has a history of a creative passion within the artistic and written world, and I think one of the key messages is that of peace, acceptance, and tolerance, and basically unity. And I think Islamic art. And, and, and that message is really important. Me personally, I'm quite happy. I'm, I'm proud of my Islamic heritage. I'm, I'm trying to be, trying to be an ad ambassador through my artwork, um, and tackle these negative stereotypes, which I which I kind of see often in the world around us. Now, one thing I would like to say, and I, and I've said it constantly, is to remember. Islamic art is never a luxury, it's a necessity. So thank you. I know I've accept, um, went over my limit, but thank you for listening. And we'll, Chris, Charles, sorry, Charles, if there's any questions in the chat, then let's go through them. Right, thank you so much. Uh, Atik, it's me, Kessra, um, uh, supporting Charles. He's had to go to a meeting. So I found this amazing, my God, what a feast for the eyes, the designs, the color, the content, and, and your lovely style of presentation and the information, the history, I've learned so much. And you are definitely very modest. <laughs> You're not one of those artists full of ego, I can assure you. <laughs> so it's been a marvelous trip, thank you so much. If you had done the workshop, we would have actually done a mural. Uh, uh, yeah. We would have, but this has been like a journey with it. So I have got some questions. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, two of them are in the QA and two were in the chat. I will read the chat ones first. This one is, uh, she says, I love uh, your art. Is there anywhere in Manchester we can see it? Now, Manchester is here. I don't know if you know anything about Manchester, but she's asking about anywhere where we can see some of your designs or something. Oh. Um, unfortunately, as much as with all street art, it's temporarily, and a lot of the walls which I I use are often are like a two months later. It's often replaced. Um, hopefully, maybe we could do something with you next year, Chris, for Macfest. But mm -hmm. normally, I uh, normally I post things on my social media from the moment I've completed the wall. So. Hopefully, I can find a permanent location, but a lot of the time it's mostly on temporary walls or um, I think that's one of the faults of street art. It is a temporary thing, but keep an eye on my social media pages and hopefully we can maybe put something on a more permanent basis. Yeah, absolutely. And we look forward to that, definitely. And I have another question. It says, for street art, who do you first contact to use a public space or are you contacted to do a commission? It's the question I asked myself. I thought, how do you go about it? How, you know, how do you find a wall and do people let you do it? So just explain the context, how it all comes about, please, if you don't mind it. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, no, sure. Of course, uh, this is what I'm here for. There's normally two processes. The, the most safest way um, is to get um, the business uh, or the building manager uh, and I get their permission. That's probably the least hassle-free way of doing it. But I find that if the moment you start using government kind of like buildings and stuff, then you have to go through many loopholes. So if you get the building manager permissions, it's more or less good to go or private London spot for more government or public buildings. Um, you know, you need to go jump flop for a lot of hoops. Um, um, I give you an example. There was one time there was this wall that I wanted to do some artwork on, 
and the artwork had to be approved by 13 people. Now, one and two is probably okay, but 13 people need to approve your design. Needless to say, that project don't go ahead, but the most easy or minimum hassle way, if you, if you see a wall and you find the person who owns that wall or building and they're happy with it, then they more or less let you get on with it. But if it's a government building or a large building, then you probably have to do, you know, a few safety forms and um, um, a few first safety forms and approval. There's some locations across the UK that offer free walls to be used for street art. Oh, really? Like, That's great. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's websites where you can find them and they offer uh, kind of like walls that you can do on. But like I said, the, the, those are some of the walls I do use to practice. But at the same time, um, those walls, will your artwork may will not be there by the end of the week because they're reused by many artists. So it's really, it's good. Like for example, this Leak Street in London and a few other location, but you know, sometimes, um, so yes, but unfortunately your work gets, will get replaced. However, sometimes in my, my, in my example with me, sometimes it, people will actually come and contact you and then there's just say, I have a wall, please use it. And that's fantastic. Um, and that's what happened with me sometimes. So there's different, there's mainly, you know, those few options, but. Thank you so much for that. Um, there's another question. This one to do with funding. Where can Muslim artists find halal funding? Quite an interesting question for us, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, if you want to chip in into this, Chris, please do. Um, a lot, I'm going to be quite frank with the people here. A lot, some of the projects which I do are kind of self-funded, the ones where I like to experiment because I have free, more freedom of control. I have some many larger kind of like friends, who, um, street artists, who also have trouble with, with funding. Because I think with funding, it's not about the art, it's these funding applications, it's more about a business proposal. Now I've had success in smaller funding, but um, there's various locations. Um, I guess the most, the most famous one is art kind of like, um, I cancel, but I know a lot of people have troubles getting that funding. Other times there's other smaller funding pots uh, that are available at the moment. Um, if, you, if you go to Art Rabbit website, they have smaller pots of funding, but I guess it's trying to like figure out what you're trying to achieve and work backwards from there. I guess with me, I kind of, with me, if it's a community project, I try to get it funded um, do various either sponsorship by the paint company uh, or you know local businesses to contribute something but if it's like a job job then you know those are just pay for itself really so unfortunately I know I didn't really answer your question but it's, it's, it's trying to decide what you're passionate about while with what you're kind of like um what you're passionate about and what you're trying to do see uh, in the great scheme of things because I know for example that I had one friend who basically did an enormous street art project which he self-funded himself and because of that he was displaying his skill he got loads of jobs after that that he got paid with I know that's nothing to do with funding but sometimes I think with people that want to see your skill set before they're willing to invest in you Thank you so much. I think that was a thorough explanation, uh, Atik. Well done for that. I've got three more, and I think we've got five minutes, so we should be okay. This one is um, about artists' creativity and ego. So I'll read. This is from Hadra part of our team. A question. How can artists and other creative people express themselves and make their work personal but avoid getting their ego involved in their work and making it too much about themselves. It's the sort of thing you've spoken about earlier as well. Yeah, I guess like it, like a, like I kind of said, it's when, it, when it comes to like art, sometimes it's the ego that's on display rather than your creativity. But 
I guess one of the most important things is, is I think it's important with this Islamic religion is your intention. Now that's basically one of the core things which is important with our religion is everything starts with your intention. Is your intention to basically create stuff just to show you how clever someone is or are you creating stuff to basically a part of a personal d- development or is it part of you know something you're trying to celebrate the divine i can't really answer that question for you because in the end it's your own intention which you're trying to show so your question is more of a question for yourself it's like what are you showing is it either you you only the individual can basically know are you selling are you putting your ego on display or you as a part of you, your personal development and i think that's one of the most important thing questions you need to ask yourself because like okay. i said attention is everything okay thank you so much now we've got a couple of questions from by the same person halima i think let me just check she's got two questions i'll choose the one the first one what particular medium did you use to create the abstract glow, the prayer images, the ones with the hoodies on? They look so cool, she said. And well, they're definitely... well, they're available to buy on my website. So that's a little sales pitch. So go to my website, tix.co.uk, and you can buy those prints on the amazing, you know, metallic paper. They look amazing. Wow. But, but as is all oh, this is given one of my trade secrets 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 away and i know this is going to be shown that's actually a really really complex process of different levels of work that's actually using the comp like i said i'm using both to digital elements and traditional elements merged together that's probably why it's such a unique piece is because i'm creating different different layers and basically rescanning photography it's a whole mixed medium of different elements which are kind of combined. So that in itself is quite a complex, those are quite complex pieces of the different elements used to create them. So like I said in my presentation, I'm using both digital and and traditional uh, methods to create something really, really unique. I mean, I think with me, I like to create stuff which I would like to put on my own walls rather than what other people think is kind of good. Okay, thank you. Another one by Halima. This is what advice would you give to a young artist who is also working with Islamic art and is combining their cultural Western motifs and designs? Um, so what advice to young artists? Always, I guess, I think this is a common, a common thing. So, um, it's always make stuff which you're happy with. Don't ever follow other people kind of like trends and stuff, make art that you like to see on your own walls and follow that passion. Because one of the things is that for one moment, this, for example, when I was growing up, it was like, oh, this is the in factor or, you know, geometry's in right now, mix a little, or this, this, just make stuff that you want to see and basically be stuff working elements that you're kind of interested in and, and, and working with. And then you'll see you produce your best work rather than creating stuff which, you know, people may consider fashionable at the time. Mm. And, and I very think that's quite good problem. advice. Very oh. good advice. Absolutely. One more question, the final one. Oh, <laughs> there's another one popping up. Okay. Uh, this is from Barbara uh, and it's about the walls. It's about graffiti and about negative messages. So let me read it. With painting sure. on walls where all ca- can see, do you have concerns about graffiti, meaning someone using your background? to put their negative message on it. And that did occur to me as well. Islamic art, Muslim, Islamophobia, all of that stuff. I think this is why with like in the UK, I, can, I stick to geometry. Um, I think I thought, and this is what I kind of said, all street art is temporarily. If it's not someone else, it'll be the weather that be affecting it, but it's creating something beautiful. Now, if it's a, no, no matter, I think there's a difference between graffiti and tagging. Now, graffiti in itself is a piece of artwork. I like graffiti, but it's this tagging which normally is, has this negative kind of association which people dislike. And I'm, me personally, I don't like tagging as well. 
but if the problem is if someone wants to do something negative you can like let's take that away like for example my artwork is probably one of the most um stolen artwork digitally that i've seen i've seen my artwork appear in various locations really yeah i mean unfortunately there's nothing really really you can do about it the moment you put it online people think it's theirs and they steal it and then Mm -hmm. i had one couple of scenarios they steal it and then reuse it or sell it well i I yeah, I just want to say something with your take. I found my first novel by, by chance discovered on, in Turkey. They had te- got bought, didn't buy the copyright, got yeah. it translated and published. And I saw my name, but I didn't recognize the writing. So what is this? Went back. And exactly. It was there. So it's, people do, especially at this moment in time, because of the digital technology in particular, very difficult yeah. to keep control of your work, I find. Yeah, and I, and I, that's the same thing. So if someone wants to tag my work, unless it's in a secure location, there's nothing really much I can do. Uh, but it's if but you find it's taggers, not other street artists, which will vandalize your work, because there's an unwritten law in the street art world where you don't destroy other people's work. Okay, thank you. Right, this is final now. Final question is from Heart and Parcel. Uh, it's about influences. Who are your biggest influences? And uh, obviously, as artists, creative people, we are always influenced by someone or other. And I'm really looking forward to see who has influenced you from the Islamic world, from Europe, from England. I, you know, the funny thing is, is that with me, I'm not really influenced by persons. Okay. Uh, um, with me, I'm actually more inspired by nature because um, um, this is a cheat because basically every time when someone thinks I've come up with a clever colour combination, I'm just stealing it from the almighty. If oh, you go to, if you go to, if, if you go to a, um, a field that's filled with flowers, yeah. there's some amazing colour combinations which I didn't even naturally think of, yes. um, you know. Um, there's all this kind of like beauty and stuff. I mean, there are artists which I respect, admire, admire and I respect them because they're amazing artists, they're creative and so on. So, but that's a different conversation. As for inspiration behind my colour schemes and stuff, I get that from nature. But there are artists who I rec- respect or are friends with. Um, but I think the secret of my, most of my stuff is actually coming from the, you know, the world that is created around us. That way I get my inspiration from. Thank I you love that. so much. Uh, it's been fab. Listen, let me read you one or two quotes. We've had lots of positive messages in the chat. And the last one is here from Mona Muhammad, a dear friend. She's the head teacher of uh, Islamic Girls School. And she will also be joining us on Saturday, Egyptian Art and Culture, mashallah. So if you've got- Oh, fantastic. Time, yeah, I look forward to it. <laughs> And this is what she said. Thank you very much for such a refreshing session and inspiring artwork. Absolutely. It's a feast for the eye, the color. Mm -hmm. I said it before. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. If you were in a live event, there'll be lots and lots of claps and you could hear all the sound. Unfortunately, this is a webinar, but I know all the comments people had. And of course, they don't need to sh- share comments. It's all there. We've seen it with our own eyes. And it's been an amazing feast, I can tell you. So oh, thank unfortunately, you. time has run out. Um, oh. It's been marvelous. Thank you so much, uh, Ati. Oh, it's been a real honor to, uh, to yeah. honor to host you. I'm glad you could join us this year, <laughs> although <laughs> digitally. And you are doing amazing work on a phenomenal scale. And of course, you're remaining true to your belief, your faith, and you have created a wonderful event. So everybody, tomorrow, we've got lots more. We've got Islamic calligraphy workshop, you can see for yourself. Then if you're into Persian cuisine with Hala, that's on Thursday. Then there's a puppet show for young people for 30 minutes. And then we've got Egyptian culture and art. So the next few days till the 31st of uh, March, we've got lots of events. Please do tune in, even for 30 minutes, 15 minutes. We really have a feast after feast. And they're all amazing, just like this young man who's joined us. And if Charles is still there, thank you so much, Charles, for coming and joining me and helping to host this and for introducing the event. So everybody, good night and good evening and assalamu alaikum and enjoy your meal if you're 
going to have it just as I am. And I'm sure Atik will go back to his mail. So again, good night and assalamu alaikum. Excellent.